Is this your, how many classes have you had already today? First one of the day? Oh, nice. So everyone's still a little, no coffee drinkers or tea drinkers? No? Um, so yeah, I'm from the States. I, got, I knew Dr. Watson, yeah, I guess it was 15 years ago. I would have said 10, but if you went there with 15, it should be fine. <laughs> uh, born in Texas, uh, if you know anything about Texas, it's, it's the land of beef. You, know, you got cattle everywhere, you know, smoked brisket, it's just, it's just a way of life, it's a lifestyle over there. But um, I went to the CIA, mostly because I was just curious. You know, when, it, when it came to, to food, I was just curious. You know, what happens if you do this? What happens if you had that? Can you do this instead of this? And then all the combinations, the way you could create, which is very exciting to me. You know, like, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, have the same meal every day. It gets kind of boring, so I'd rather try something new. I remember my mom when I was like, uh, like primary school, very very young. You know, she she would make sandwiches. But I would always complain of, oh no, why, why is this this way? Why is that that way? So she's like, no, do it yourself. So like, okay, I'll do it myself. There was a joke that I was going to start working at a subway, but uh, I never did, so it was worked out. Uh, fast forward a few years to Asia. I actually moved to mainland China first for a couple years. I was with the Grappas group. I was with the Grappas restaurants here. And they have a few restaurants and bars, but um, I was in Dongun. For, for two years. Very, very different from here. I like it. I, I learned a lot. Um, I, I'm not likely to go back, but uh, so it was fun. Uh, while I was there, I, I was just brainstorming about you know, different restaurants that could work, you know, be successful, especially in, in China or, or the Asia market. And then we were just talking about random things like you know, the popularity of Mongolian barbecue or, or you know, the Taiwanese hot pot style compared to the Korean. But then around that time, I guess it was 2008, 2009, there was those food scares. You know, we had like uh, E. coli and spinach, and you know, people were worried about chemicals in this and you know, hormones in that. So I, I just thought one day, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you, know, you went to a restaurant, and I was thinking like a fast casual, like a, kind of like a cafe de corral. But you, know, you go in, and then you just see the produce on the wall, and then you, you, you watch the, the server go over there and you know, go pick the lettuce for your salad. No, it was a... It was a way to guarantee what you were eating was safe. And I think at the time it was very important. And I think ever since then, it's been increasingly important, especially with the internet. You know, information is just so readily available. You, know, you can't hide anything. You can't be, you know, people want to know if they're being lied to. And they don't want to do business or continue patronizing or patroning places that are, that are not truthful and not, not honest. So that was just, it was just a random thought. Let us, let's, put, let's put the lettuce and the, the vegetables inside. And with that came the research. So I thought, OK, you need this, and you need light requirements, water. And then the more I started learning about that, the more I started learning about the plants themselves. And then you, you figure out, OK, you know, this one's good for, your, for eye health. This one's good for your heart health. Or if you do this, it's good for weight loss or cholesterol. And then on accident, I. I my mindset started to change, and my lifestyle started to change to one that was more plant-based. Because it was just, I, I was seeing the benefits. You know, when I lived in China, I was, I was a little puffier, a little rosy. You know, some can say the air quality, but you no, know, I was not eating correctly all the time. And once I made some adjustments, you know, a lot of things cleared up right away. So I had dinner, actually with, Dr. Watson and a friend of his at the time, who ended up being my employer for the next two years. He had a restaurant with a partner called Mana. I don't know if you've ever heard of it in Central. They have like two or three right now, but um, all, only vegetarian. Uh, most of it's vegan. Well, they, they have like some eggs, some cheeses, but nothing really, there's no chicken, there's no fish. And they've been there for five or six years. And then later that, that same, Employer went on to open up another restaurant called Homey to Live. It used to, it's in the Hang Seng Bank, where it used to be a Burger King, which is a pretty fun story. But um, yeah, it was just from that I was learning on the job. You no, know, I'd never been a vegetarian chef before, and you know, I worked in Italian restaurants and country clubs and fine dining. I was at a three Michelin star spot in New York City for a while, and it just wasn't my cup of tea, so I had to get out. But um, 
yeah, just being in open kitchens and you know, seeing the customers, you know, imagine a Friday night, Saturday night, and they're having a good time, and you're just, you're just part of that. You know, usually as a cook, you're in, in the basements, and it's white walls and all that, and you're just, you know, you're away from, from the action. And it's just kind of isolating. So as I got more into it, I, you know, open kitchens, being interactive with the guests, and for me that was very important. You know, what better way to improve yourself, the products you're working on, with immediate feedback. You know, hey, and how's this? So, oh yeah, it could have been more salt or too spicy, or I like cucumbers, or you know, whatever it is. You know, that interaction is very important. That uh, I, I wouldn't want to say personalization, but, but it makes a big deal. You know, when you think of a brand's, you know, I mentioned Cafe de Corral, McDonald's. Um, think of any of the fine dining restaurants here in Hong Kong. It's not so much that name, that building, that makes a difference in your experience, but it's those people that you interact with. And there's a lot more of that. Uh, although with digital these days, there's more, some places are moving away from people, but that, that's, that's a totally different aspect. So for me, it was how we interacted with each other and how we interacted with our food. And it can completely change your... Your, your lifestyle. Uh, that restaurant at Homey to Live, it, it closed down. Uh, there was just some, some disagreements along the way and it closed its doors. And now I'm at Chow Chow, uh, it's an Italian restaurant in Long Kwai Fong. It's, it's not plant-based, but uh, we're actually partnering right now with a Singapore-based company called Salad Stop. Uh, they have like 17 outlets in Singapore, 15 in Manila, where else? Korea, Japan, I think some in Vietnam, I think one in Germany. Uh, next month, we're going to open one in Taikushing, and then the next one would be uh, Admiralty, Pacific Place 3. So even though the restaurant I'm not at, it, you know, they see the value of the future, of what's to come. You know, there's, there's such a, an increasing demand for plant-based foods, especially with the internet. I mean, just the information is out there. You, you have a question, blah, blah, oh, what's kale? What's chia? You know, people want to know these things. They want to try these things. Uh, things like this usually pick up a little faster in the States, but very over the past, I can say, five or six years here in Hong Kong, it's been just increasing the amount of people who want to be in a safe environment, have safe food, you know, take, they take care of their health. You know, there's, so many, there's so many stresses. I'm sure you guys have your exams and you know, projects and pressures. You know, it gets stressful sometimes. You know, you're just you're nervous about a bag of chips. Just kind of, it's there, and it's about recognizing these bad habits that help you. What's the word? Like find peace of mind. I guess is probably the right way to say it in, in Hong Kong. Um, when I came over here, we were talking about future of food, you know, food trends. Anything in I think primarily in Asia would be an interesting concern. Uh, I saw a slide briefly that was up before I came in. What are some of the things you've talked about already? Yeah? Food, food trends? Yeah, food. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. This healthy food items. Healthy food items? Yeah. Would that be at restaurants that have you know, meat dishes and, and fish dishes but also have healthy or just like healthy only? Mixing. And what do you like to eat? Well, anyone can. What are some of the food trends that you're seeing in Hong Kong now? He talked about healthy items. What's another one? Which one? Street food. Oh, that's an interesting one. Hong Kong style street food or street food from other countries? Hong Kong style street food. Can you think of any examples? Any places that you know that have done that? What about trends with technology in, in restaurants? What's, what's new that hasn't been there five years ago or even one year ago? Automation? As far as what? Are we talking about the server ordering? For you on an iPad, or are you ordering yourself? Those big screens. Huh? How do you guys feel about those? <laughs> no, that's a great example. 
McDonald's spends a lot of money in research to find out what's going to be new, and then they, they try to cater to you know, the demands, what the, the paths they see in the path. Well, have you guys ever used those? And is it easier? And is there any improvements you would do, changes? It needs to be faster. Okay. I think it'll get there. Yeah, for me, what I'm interested in in Hong Kong, I think globally, would be plant-based foods, either more and more menu items or more and more restaurants that are only plant-based, or the technology that's used in those restaurants. Uh, anybody familiar with uh, augmented reality, AR? I think some of the phones do it now, right? The Samsungs and the iPhone X and all those. Anybody play Pokemon on your phone? Pokemon Go, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that there's, what are you, any Snapchat users? That's actually very interesting, I was, I was surprised. Um, Snapchat has a fe feature, you know, some of the lenses have an augmented reality where you, know, you, you do a filter and there's an item that's, and it's usually your you know, bitmoji or some kind of dancing hot dog, but it, it's stationary, you know, so if I, I could, as if I was walking around and it was here. And I think that kind of technology, it, okay, it's a dancing hot dog, but applied to what you can do in a restaurant, I, mean, I just think the experience for a customer would be greatly improved with these technologies. And it's more about implementing. I know some hotels in different countries have like the, the Amazon Alexa in every room so that you, know, you can order your taxi and by the time you get downstairs, it's there. Or uh, you know, check out with the concierge and then just go down and leave. No need to go through a, a line or wait. And I just think those technologies are gonna be very beneficial in restaurants. And it's just a matter of applying it the right way. You know, it's, it's about making the employee's life much easier so that they have a better time you know, reacting and interacting with, with the guests that come by. Food. Dr. Watson, did you have any questions that you specifically wanted answered? Um, yeah, it was 400 to 500 people on that one. Five, include, six including you. Yeah, yeah. Right, six so five students and then. So yeah, we were in, the school we were at was similar to this. It wasn't a culinary school. But what it was, you no know, we had a hospi hospitality management. So you know, there's the classes for business, finance, you know, cooking for quantity foods. That was one of the classes I met with Dr. Watson. But uh, one of the events that we got to do because of his involvement with a with a group in the Culinary Institute of America in New York was this function that 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 celebrates. Would you say minority achievement in the industry? It was, it was the Black Culinary Alliance, and then they put on this this gala style dinner at the, the, the Marriott in Times Square every year. And just a massive amount, of, it's, it's, it's fundraising, it's awareness, it's education, you know, all those facets where you know, more light needed to be shown, they, they were there to, to bring it. And yeah, these dinners were doing 400 to 500 people each night. And what they had was they had different schools from different areas doing each of the courses. So like your, you know, your salad was from one place, your appetizer was next, so on. But they were all culinary schools, so everyone was trained or training cooks, and they, they you know, had their gear, this and that, all these knives. But that wasn't the case for us. We were a, a hospitality program that had cooking classes, so we, we didn't have the expertise at the time that they, those students did. But, but we had the access, but we eventually, we may do, and it was five of us who had never been in large scale production. On how do you make 500, seared duck dishes and get those out on time so that they're all hot. You know, the first one's just as hot as the number 500. And it was just, when you're in that kind of zone, it just happens. <laughs> you just do it. There, there's no thinking, there's no, you, know, you prepare, you, know, you, you, you do all your you know, measure twice, cut once, you, know, you have to make sure that you do your playing ahead of time. Okay, how many people, how many portions? You, know, you gotta allow a bit extra in case, okay, somebody's gonna drop something or somebody's gonna burn something so you, you can't have you can't have excuses, so you, got, you have to be prepared. So whatever you have to do to get through that, you know, we had to rock it out, and I think we did, and we were, we did well. I mean, we did, we did all five. I think some of the other schools were a little impressed because they had 
10 to 15 students per course, and there was five of us who didn't know what we were doing. Well, we knew what we were doing, but we just never had the hands-on experience like that before. So it was very exciting. And uh, you know, you're learning about, about yourself. You, know, you, you can't just think about it and be nervous and scared. You just, you just do. You know? And if, if you try it and you like it, and then you've, you've learned something about yourself. And if you don't, that's OK. It's, it's already enough to, to try something else. What did you take away from that, uh, that dinner? The first one, the first one. The first one was challenging. Um, so when we first met, we talked about how mass catering, you're looking at large amounts of people. So I had done this event as a student when I was here with you guys, I think back in 2000. And my mentor put 10 of us, like he mentioned, uh, from CIA to do the main course. Now, we were all very well trained, and so when I became a teacher, and because I had done it, and it was a little bit arrogant, I was like, all right, well, I want to take students to do the same thing. And Anthony was part of the first group. What I didn't realize was that what we were doing in classes, as he mentioned, wasn't that. The most we had ever cooked for was maybe 90 people. Nine. I think the quantity, quantity food was a fifth, designed for people of 50. Right, yeah. And we just had one random had big one day of 90. Big dinner that <laughs> we did once. Um, so we talked about kitchens, taking a team. I took six students, five students, to a place where none of us had ever cooked before. I knew nothing about the kitchen. I knew nothing about the refrigeration, the ovens. It was, it could have been disastrous. Everything could have been burnt. Four at the minimum. Well, that was the second time. The, the first time. Oh, it was probably six. Yeah. Six then, yeah. It had six components for 500 people. And so you have one of us, each has one component. You can't mess up. When I put the order in. You can't stop either. <laughs> yeah, you can't stop either because the belt is just going. When I put the order in, I ordered exactly 500 pieces of chicken. Luckily, 30 people didn't show up, so we only did 470. But the second time we went, we all learned from that. And so what we did is we looked at what we were doing. We were the only school outside of uh, New York to be invited ever. Um, and so that's where we did the duck dish. Very, very simple, seared duck, gastric, uh, some vegetable, and then something else. Puree. Like puree, the puree. Um, and so what we did, instead of trying to wild people with technique, we focused on flavors, kind of like the slide that I showed you mentioned. That school is still a little bit more known now, but not as well known as the other schools locally. Again, three to five students just like you. Actually, you guys probably knew more than they did back then at this point. We're able to do what the top culinary schools in the United States were doing. We were actually more efficient. Um, he's being modest, but we, we were the best students. Unlike the schools who had armies of people peeling carrots and doing all types of things, it was just the six of us. There was even one year when Anthony was long gone that I took three students, and we did a duo dish of lamb for 500, which could have ended in disaster, but luckily my mentor from CIA was there to help us with play it. Um, I wanted him to talk about this because you're looking at designing menus for a large scale as chefs, we want to be extravagant. We want everyone to be wowed by our food and the plates and presentations. And in a restaurant, when you've got 80 and 90 people seated, you can do that on a consistent basis, easily. But the moment you start having to produce plates for 200, 300, 500, 1,000, all of that goes away. You can try and do that, but you need an arm. I didn't have an arm. And as a chef, that was a very important lesson that I learned. Because that first year, if it did not go well, I don't think we would have been asked to come back. And looking back, you, you cut, what, two cases of cilantro? 
<laughs> so two cases of coriander, like cases, two full boxes. I think he was there for hours while we were handling everything else. And then I had to cut two cases of pork too and make butter, marinate chicken, and do right. It was a terrible experience as a chef, but they did it. I was so happy that they did it. Um, even now, when I make menus for large productions, I think back to how difficult that was. And I never want to do that again. Ever. But um, yeah, people still talk about it, actually. They, they ask, where's the school from Texas? And I said, hmm, I don't know. Uh, I haven't been there for eight years now. But um, I'd love to take a group from here. I think we would have fun if we were able to go. To New York? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, <laughs> Two restaurants coming, two yeah. restaurants opening in yeah. May. Yeah. Might be a good person to talk to if you, if you need some employment here in the near future. Um, so, no questions. I don't do business cards anymore, but yeah, any one of these just. We can tell them why you don't do business cards. <laughs> I don't do business cards anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's well, we talked about this, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's, you can't be of a sustainable mindset and continuously do things that aren't sustainable. And so some people globally, not just chefs, they're looking at electronic ways of communication using social media instead of the traditional business card. Uh, I just got 500 from the school. I don't know how many trees I killed just to have my business cards. Um, he's a little bit more socially aware, but that's part of the reason why he doesn't. I'm trying to teach him a bit. Yeah. I'm trying to teach him a bit. Well, they give it to me. I can't say The, um, I guess hearing you say that about that, that first trip to New York, and I guess a lesson I now realize I've been learning this entire time was, for me, it's very easy to, to well, for anybody, your ego is probably your, your hardest challenge to overcome, like yourself. You're the biggest thing in your way of, of anything you want to do. And getting that ego, kicking it off to the side and just adapting to what has to get done. You know, you're talking about, no, chefs want to wow, and, and, and this is true, you know. We, 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 there's so many that perfect a dish, perfect a technique, and then they're, they're known for that. And that's, that's very honorable amongst you know, our profession. Uh, where I've taken my career path is, has not been that way. I've been more democratic. You know, I want to hear from my, my team, especially new people that are, you know, don't have a lot of experience in the kitchen. Because they're going to, just because of the naivety of not knowing the industry, they're going to have some random idea that I never would have thought of. And then whatever I was working on is now better for that. And it's not about... I never think of things as my dish. No. When, when I, I'm the chef, so whatever leaves the kitchen is, is my fault, regardless of if I touched it or not. So you know, if, if this guy burns something, if that one didn't put enough salt and it leaves, I can't say, well, well, it's him. Well, it's her. It's me. So if I can make it a more process where they have input on that, well, chef, I was thinking we could do this. So we try it. Um, the worst that happens is we make it once. It tastes horrible, and then we don't do it again. And I just like putting your ego aside, adapting um, my cooking. You're asking about my cooking style. You know? I think the French say à la rache. With, um, à la rache, basically, like shooting from the hip, we'd say in Texas. Uh, just whatever, whatever you have available is, is what you use. You know, what, just be resourceful. You know, I, I don't want to think of a dish that needs this and that and this, and then we go to a place and they don't have any of those th two, two or three tools that I need. Uh, okay, what do I do now? You know, so I, I want it to be a, a process that evolves and adapts with the environment, the people, you know, and it's the basics too. You know, my, uh, one of my favorite examples with him is uh, salt. Uh, when, I, when I first met him, he really loved salt in his food. If, it, if it's a nice, it's a beautifully tasting dish, he's like, eh, needs more salt. And not just for my food, just he goes to restaurants and then. I put salt on bacon. Because <laughs> I, I needed that kick. Now, personally, that's okay. Let him enjoy it. But he has the self awareness, which is another key important. 
to know that his level of salt is here, or spice, or sour, or whatever, whatever you like. You can have your own personal levels, but for on a professional scale that's going to you know, sell well, be very approachable to the masses, you need to adjust very quickly. You need to taste it. It's like, you know what? I want this a bit more spicy, but I know this is right for the restaurant, or for these groups, or for this event. And just that, that yeah, constantly adapting. I think it's been my favorite. The learning and the adapting has been my favorite part of this entire industry. And since everyone in the world eats, I can pretty much travel anywhere and eat or cook or, yeah, it's doing fun. So I think to sum it all up, the future, all these trends, they're very unique, they're very different aspects of the industry, but they're all focusing towards a customer-centric philosophy. You know, what, what's, what's new for the customer? What's enjoyable for the customer? What's going what's gonna to keep them coming back? You know, what's... I mean, there's the art of it, you know, the art of creating, which, which I love, so to see something that's not even there, and then you, you order this, you chop this, and all of a sudden you got you know, something that never existed before. That's pretty exciting. But on the business side of it, there's still the consistency. There's still you know, metrics. How do, how do you scale it up? How do you, how do you not scale? And how do you adjust to the needs of the market? Could be a you know, street, cart, street food stall or a fine dining restaurant. You can't always do what you've always done. You always have to keep changing. I guess that's probably the biggest takeaway I could take. Chance for a last one? I was serious about the job for a minute. Okay. Well, thank you, Chef. Thank you, sir.